The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon China Report. We have a really eclectic and exciting show tonight. Um, as far as Israel and the Hamas, they are still here. The new phenomenon, no doubt about it, is uh, ISIS. I mean, the emergence to power, the appearance of this organization that took over, you know, uh, major parts, significant parts of Syria and Iraq, is now in control of a territory which is bigger than the territory of Great Britain or France. I think this is the major uh, phenomenon and, of course, the American decision to launch uh, a campaign against this organization. And when we speak about the Syrian opposition, there is no such a thing as Syrian opposition. There are uh, several armed groups fighting each other, sometimes uh, fighting together the, the regime, but uh, the lack of cohesion and uh, unity among the ranks of the rebels, that's actually is what uh, uh, that's actually is what uh, causing uh, uh, what lead the war to uh, continue. Nowadays, we should speak about Syrian states. This is to say, I mean, there is no uh, any more um, the stable and strong state we used to know in the past. Now there is the ISIS state to the east. Uh, enclaves of uh, rebels all over the, the country and the very limited and small uh, Syrian state uh, held by uh, Bashar. So he is in power, but it's only part of the, um, of the picture. First of all, historically, he gave them support when they fought the Americans in Iraq. ISIS started as a branch of Al-Qaeda established in 2003 when the Americans invaded Iraq and at that time Bashar supported uh, these uh, groups who fought the Americans. Nowadays, you know, that's the nature of the war in Syria. Everybody is against everybody and at the same time cooperating with, you know, so at the same time he is fighting ISIS, the, uh, his enemies. And at the same time, there is indirect cooperation. I mean, for uh, an example, they are exporting the oil. He is in a need of, uh, of oil, so he is buying oil from uh, these guys. So, you know, fighting them and at the same time, uh, well, I wouldn't say giving them support, but coordinating with them, uh, uh, buying some oil from them, allowing, you know, the passages of, of, of uh, goods and uh, men from their territory into uh, Syria. That's the nature of this uh, civil war, bloody civil war that is going on in Syria for the last four years. I think that those who support them, and once again, indirectly, are Turkey and Saudi Arabia. That's, I think, uh, is the reason for the difficulties the American administration is facing in his efforts to uh, contain ISIS, to launch a major significant campaign against ISIS because you can't fight them when, first of all, you limit yourself only to airstrikes. And second, when uh, some of your major allies think that with all due respect to ISIS, there are other enemies, there are other challenges, and uh, ISIS for them uh, is only part of the picture and not the, the, the main issue here. Well, first of all, they have their own resources. They took over many of the oil fields in Syria itself. As I mentioned before, they are in control of a territory which is bigger than the territory of France or Great Britain. Almost 10 million uh, people live in the territories they are in full control over. But apart from that, no doubt about it that at least in the past, maybe even today, some uh, rich businessmen, mainly from the Gulf, 
who are inspired by their ideology uh, give them support. I guess there, was, there is also popular support. I mean, many Muslim communities on the, uh, Muslim individuals all over the world do, I mean, some of them volunteer to fight for them in uh, Syria and Iraq, and some send them uh, small amounts of money, but altogether. I, I guess that the Syrian regime is in a desperate need for oil. There is an embargo, there are sanctions uh, imposed on, on, on Syria by the international community or by the Americans. So why not to buy from them in a good price? I mean, uh, they are ready to buy well for 20 uh, or even less dollars. So it's uh, a bargain. I mean, this is something that... And as I said before, this is part of the nature of the war in Syria. You fight them on the one hand, and on the other hand, you buy oil from them. And we need uh, to wait and see what will happen with ISIS, because ISIS is the main threat nowadays to Bashar al-Assad. It's a big question. I mean, for almost four years, he's uh, managed to survive. He's bleeding, seriously, severely. And, and, and there are many uh, rebel groups inside Syria that have nothing to do with uh, ISIS, uh, cause him to bleed. I mean, uh, are not strong enough to decide the battle and to defeat him, but they cause him to bleed. So it's a great, it's a very good question with no, uh, with no answer, but for the time being, he's still in power, yes, we cannot deny it. You know, some uh, tactical change on the ground in Syria, well, in the framework of these changes, rebels group took over the entire Syrian Golan Heights, so on the other side of the, uh, of, of the border, uh, on the Golan Heights, you can find rebel groups, some of them uh, connected with uh, Al-Qaeda a Nusra group, uh, the Nusra Front, which is actually a local branch established in Syria by, by Al-Qaeda. But for the time being, they leave Israel aside and focus uh, on, the, on the regime. But ISIS, yes, there is this possibility that in the coming future, they will increase their pressure on the regime, they will lead to the collapse, this pressure will lead to the collapse of the Syrian regime and eventually they will take over Syria. Uh, Bashar is still doing well, uh, but in the coming future we can't exclude this possibility. Well, you know, you know uh, we have no alternative for Bashar and the real dilemma or choice is between Bashar and ISIS and, you know, Israel uh, got used to deal with states. You can deter them, you can create some sort of balance with these people, you know, with uh, semi-states, with organization actor like ISIS. We don't know really how to uh, behave, how to respond to the, such a challenge. So I guess, yes, the answer will be that most Israelis will prefer to stay with Bashar, the devil we know, or they capture. Uh, from the Iraqi army, which was defeated by them in uh, last June, July. So these are, you know, uh, the most advanced weapon uh, supplied by the Americans to the Iraqi army, and now uh, it's in the hands of uh, ISIS. They also capture uh, advanced Russian advanced weapon from the Syrian army. So they are not in a desperate need for new weapon, but uh, of course they can buy, not advanced missiles, not uh, tanks, but uh, um, something which is lighter, uh, uh, machine guns, uh, uh, this kind of weapon is very easily, it can be bought in the region, you know, from Libya, from Syria, from, you know, uh, defectors from the Iraqi or the Syrian army. I guess also that at this stage or another, Turkey or Saudi Arabia supply them with weapons uh, to encourage them to fight the Iranians and the Iraqis in Iraq and the Syrian army in Syria. So I don't see right now that they are in a desperate need for uh, more and new types of uh, advanced weapons. Iraq, there is no anymore such a country called uh, Iraq. There used to be a country, but it collapsed, it declined, and now we speak about uh, the Shiites of Iraq. Yes, clearly they are afraid of uh, uh, ISIS, but they can do very little. I mean, the Iraqi army was defeated by ISIS. I mean, 
uh, territories, regions uh, populated by Sunnis, generally speaking, uh, tend to support ISIS because they feel that they were humiliated, suppressed by the Shiites in Baghdad. As for Saudi Arabia, yes, the Saudis are afraid of ISIS, but at the same time they uh, want to use ISIS to contain the, what they call the Iranian threat to fight the Iranians and the Shiites in Iraq and to give a fight to the Syrian uh, regime in Syria. So here again an example where you fight ISIS on the one hand, on the other hand you support it when it comes to the war uh, launched by ISIS against the Shiites, against Iran and against uh, the Syrian regime. Well, it's very interesting because on the one hand, on the popular level, uh, Israel is very much hated in Jordan by the Jordanian public. Uh, many Palestinians, they focus on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there is tension between the leaders, but at the same time, as always, you know, uh, very intimate uh, military coordination and cooperation against ISIS in regard to what is happening in Syria. So it goes on and Jordan is in, in, in need, a uh, clear need for Israeli uh, support. And uh, well, Jordan is our neighbor to the east. We totally dependent on the goodwill of the Jordanians. I mean, the alternative is the spread of chaos and terror. So clearly we there is very little to do right now because ISIS uh, didn't start any attack against uh, Jordan, but both countries do follow very closely the events in Syria and Iraq and prepare themselves for uh, anything that might happen. Uh, Mubarak has to do with the past. I think that uh, this was the main reason for the decision taken by, uh, I, I would say, the Egyptian system. We do not know whether it was as a result of an order given from the presidency in Egypt or uh, the military was involved or simply the judges, but they all belong to the what I would call the system, the Egyptian system that is now in full control over the country. Uh, they want to start uh, a new beginning and in order to make this start you need to uh, mark a clear line and separate yourself from the past. Uh, that's why I guess that it was in their interest to bring uh, the story of Mubarak to an end. Mubarak was uh, the president, Mubarak was the commander of the army, he was also the commander of Sisi. I mean, if you blame him, you blame the entire system. If you find him guilty, what about the policemen, what about the generals who gave the orders on, in, on his behalf? So it was in their interest to finish with this uh, story. The interesting question is how this uh, decision will be accepted by the Egyptian public. There is tension. But for the time being, I guess that most Egyptians will tell you we want to go on, to continue. Uh, we don't want to look all the time into the past. Some groups operating in Egypt announce their loyalty to ISIS. So already Egypt is engaged in a war with terrorists uh, uh, fighting the Egyptian army on Egyptian soil. But as for Iraq or Syria, I, I, don't, I doubt it very much whether uh, Egypt will go to war for what. I mean, they don't consider ISIS as an immediate threat to Egypt. And why should they help the Americans who failed to support the Sisi government and still remind Sisi that he should uh, be more democratic and uh, uh, should uh, engage in a dialogue with the Muslim Brothers So the Egyptians. There is no any reason um, to engage in a war in Iraq or in uh, Syria. So apart from some declaration, I don't expect the Egyptian to do anything about ISIS. It led the so-called Arab Spring, or what happened in uh, many of the Arab countries, led to the collapse, to the destruction of the Libyan state and to the spread of chaos there, led to the destruction of the Syrian state, led to the emergence to power of uh, ISIS in Iraq and in uh, Syria, 
in Egypt it led to a change, but this change uh, would have occurred anyhow because Mubarak was old, 86, uh, when the revolution took over. He was uh, 80, uh, 82, I mean, so uh, changes, uh, political changes in Egypt would have occurred anyhow. So even in the case of Egypt, the uh, impact was very limited and the price paid by the Egyptians was very really was very high so all in all there was a good will there I mean uh, people young people in the uh, streets of Cairo and Damascus but the result was a total failure we have to admit it you, you know we need to be patient I mean these are uh, historical processes uh, they take time you know uh, Russia too you can argue the Russians are not prepared and not ready for, uh, ready for democracy and the result is what we have now in Russia. But in other countries it did work, you know, in India, in Latin America, you know, so we need to be patient. But clearly uh, we need to wait and see whether there is uh, readiness within the society, within the Arab society. Probably the Arab society is not ready yet and we'll, be, uh, we'll need to wait some more years. Well, Israeli-Palestinians, uh, I mean a part of Israel, citizens of Israel, but their nationality is Palestinian, I mean, and uh, they can't, uh, nobody can uh, deny it. Now, what is stronger, the sense that they are part of the state of Israel and they are Israeli citizens or uh, that they are part of the Palestinian uh, people and part of the Palestinian uh, nation. First of all, there is tension. I wouldn't call it uprising, I wouldn't call it intifada, you know, such tensions you can see also in the States against similar, you know, when we look at what is happening right now in the state, uh, the tension between the police and uh, uh, protesters in many of the American uh, uh, cities and towns, well, so the tension is, uh, is there, no doubt uh, about it. I wonder, I guess that many wonder whether this is uh, a fight, this is a struggle uh, for civil rights or for national rights. This is a struggle to uh, better integrate into the Israeli society and become uh, uh, equal citizens or whether we speak here about, you know, a national struggle in order to separate themselves, the Arabs, from the State of Israel. I think that the majority see themselves as citizens of Israel, uh, but of course there are those who exploit the process, seize the opportunity and try to uh, encourage them to uh, uh, move against, uh, against the State of Israel. I think the majority want to be part of Israel, but uh, a lot should be done about it. I mean, uh, there is a social tension, uh, clearly any, uh, there is still, you know, there are Palestinians, so they are um, influenced by uh, the Arab-Israeli or the Palestinian-Israeli uh, conflict. It's quite uh, clear. We should work very hard to integrate them fully into the Israeli uh, society, give them the feeling that they are part of Israel and at the same time uh, suppress any moves or any efforts to uh, uh, incite them against the state of Israel. It's up to us to convince them. It's up to us to let them understand that it's better for them to be part of the state of Israel and with all due respect, and there is respect for their uh, commitment or uh, nation, uh, Palestinian nationality, well, uh, they are part of the Palestinian uh, nation or people, but uh, apart from being part of the Palestinian people, there is nothing they can do, uh, I mean, in the sense that to join uh, the Palestinian struggle against Israel, Israel and so on and so forth. Uh, for the last 66 years, we did well. I mean, they were part of the State of Israel. They were not at all engaged, most of them, in any uh, terrorist activity against uh, Israel. So it can be achieved, but uh, we should invest all, all of our efforts. Goodwill should be seen on the other side as well, but it's in our hands. I mean, when Israel annexed East Jerusalem, 
it gave theoretically the Palestinians who lived there uh, the right to become citizens of Israel. But they didn't want to become citizens of Israel. So instead, what they have is uh, a different uh, certificate. I mean, the citizens uh, that they live, they, uh, Israel is their residency, but they uh, are not citizens of uh, Israel as such. They cannot vote for the Knesset. They can vote for the, uh, for the, uh, in the municipal election, but they see it as some sort of recognition of the annexation of uh, East Jerusalem to Jerusalem following the six-day wars. Since they live in the state of Israel, they are not citizens, but they live in the state of Israel, they have many rights. But at the same time, uh, they are not full citizens because of their, it was their own choice. And um, of course, when you look at Jerusalem and uh, Israeli governments uh, say to themselves, well, maybe in the future it will be part of a Palestinian state. And the starting point was very low. So clearly there is a big gap, very deep gap between the economic and the social situation in West Jerusalem and this is of those who live in uh, uh, East Jerusalem. And that's what brings people in East Jerusalem to argue that, well, you know, we have uh, some rights, but not all of the rights. If you look at the amounts that are invested by the government in West Jerusalem and compare them to the amounts uh, which are invested in East Jerusalem, there is a big gap. That's what creates some resentment and uh, hostility, no doubt about it. The Leon Sharney Report congratulates the team of BDC, The Price of Peace, and Leon Sharney on the New York Emmy Awards win. The documentary reveals the true story of the negotiations leading up to the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time, the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Watch it on Hulu.com or buy the special feature edition DVD at select stores. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Long. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. Welcome to another Leon Charney Report. We are uh, traveling around Israel to find out how split this country is. So far we see it's 50-50. And about once a year we're given the privilege of uh, meeting with Yitzhak Shamir, the former Prime Minister of Israel, the longest serving Prime Minister in the history of Israel. 
Many people think that Ben Gurion was the longest serving, but it was not. It was Yitzhak Shamir, and uh, Yitzhak Shamir was uh, uh, prime minister in many tumultuous periods of uh, this country, and uh, he's very well known for the Madrid Peace Conference. In any case, uh, we welcome you to the show again, Mr. Uh -huh. Prime Minister. And uh, you are welcome. <laughs> Maybe he's not your best friend or your, or, or your most admired personality, maybe he is, but Abe Ibn was on my show a few weeks ago and said that he thinks this is one of the toughest and possibly worst periods in the history of Israel. Would you agree? Which, now? Yeah. I don't think, it's not a pleasant uh, period in our history, in our life, but it's not so bad. There is an exaggeration. You have a uh, Likud prime minister directly elected, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, and I sense in you a little bit of disappointment. I've read some articles about it, so uh, I know that you're a little bit disappointed. Well, yes. Uh, <coughs> there are uh, some, uh, some reasons to be disappointed uh, and to have some uh, frustrations. But uh, the, main, uh, the main reasons for it is that uh, my claim that uh, Mr. Netanyahu doesn't have any principles. That's all. And it's a very, very important uh, lacune. <laughs> yes. Is and that a surprise to you, by the way? Yes. Yes, because he wrote a few books, you know, and now in his uh, career, when he has the opportunity to make uh, facts and to create facts, he doesn't have uh, principles. And uh, he forgets from time to time of what he said uh, yesterday or some, uh, some weeks before. And this is my main uh, frustration. Do you think he has a strategic plan of how he wants to see this country? I don't imagine. I don't think. I don't think so that he has a plan. He tries to please, to please people. Uh, but to do it without having any principles, any clear principles, and the principles to which he is faithful, I don't think you are able to please people. People like honest men and serious men. You think he's an honest man? Well, I will not say the contrary of it. <laughs> There's an implication, though. Ah, no. The uh, uh, prime minister was elected directly. You, Shimon Perez, as I understand it, Moshe Ahrens, are forming a committee to try and repeal this law and bring back the old law? Yes, I think that this law has to be changed, has to be abolished. I think so. It does a lot of damage. And I think uh, we will succeed with it because people don't like it. You know, the Israelis are real Democrats. And this law of uh, personal uh, election is not according to our character as a people. Since uh, our uh, history, well, many thousands of years ago, we don't like absolute powers. We don't like despots or demagogues. Not. We are a real democratic people. This law is, uh, there's no check and balance like there is in the United States. Sure, yet. sure. So it's a very dangerous law. It's a dangerous law. And therefore, we think, uh, many people think that it has to be abolished. It, but it's not very easy, you know, it, it, the, to abolish it and to change it. But I think uh, it will be made, it will be done. 
the uh, the law as it stands today, as you understand it, um, I believe it takes 80 members of the Knesset to bring down a prime minister and stay in position. It takes 61 members of the Knesset to yeah. bring down the government, but then they all have to run for re-election. Re yes, of course. Uh, That's not a very practical thing, is it? <laughs> it's not practical for the members of the Knesset. <laughs> Uh, but uh, it's not good for the country. It's not good for the country. I think that uh, this is not to be the, uh, the fundamental strength of a leader. The leader has to be supported by the great majority of his citizens. A consensus builder? Consensus. And well, it's, unfortunately, this is not the situation. Uh, you're still a member, I assume, of the Likud party? I am. I am a member of the party since a long time. Since you know. the party began. Yeah. Uh, I understand that there's a movement now, possibly by the prime minister, to abolish primaries in the party? Yes, but I think this is not the most important thing. I, I was interviewed today by our TV, by our radio, yes, and I told them that uh, this is not the most important problem, the way of the elections, the form of the elections. I think we have to decide, the parties to decide, about principles. What are the principles of this party? People have to know for what they are voting, not how they are voting. This is more important from all points of view, politically, socially, uh, morally. And I think that uh, they have to have debates, but first of all, about the leading principles of the movement. Most people think that uh, the Israeli Jews are not concerned about the American Jews in terms of this new conversion law. And I know that you had a problem in your government about who is a Jew, and what you did is you formed the unity government. Yes, this was the main reason. One of the main reasons for me to form a unity government, because without it, I couldn't make it without uh, accepting this law that uh, I opposed. And since then, nobody said a word about uh, who is a Jew. And now we have again this uh, problem. I regret very much that uh, the representatives of the uh, the reform movement and the conservatives didn't accept this uh, uh, compromise uh, position because we cannot uh, otherwise uh, get this unity which we need without any compromise. We have to find a compromise. And uh, I hope that one day a compromise will be found. How important are the American Jews for Israel? So very important. Was well, any Jews for me important? And it's a great part in America. It's a great part of our people. And uh, well, uh, I would like to have a great part of them here in Israel. You know, the the for instance the uh, immigration area of the uh, Russian Jewish people, the Soviet was a great contribution to the country, to our economy, to our demography. And uh, I think that uh, Aliyah, even smaller from the United States, will be a, a very, very important contribution to our progress. Last time we spoke about uh, one of the um, um, aspects of your prime ministership where you thought that one of the greatest things that you accomplished was this great immigration sure. of Soviet Jewry. Well, I am faithful to my principles. <laughs> and you're consistent. 
Uh, they have formed their own political party. As you know, you know, Mr. Sharansky. Sharansky was a very good man. What is the power of that party today? Today, it's a, uh, they are a small party, but they have a certain influence. And I don't know what will be the future of this party, but they play a role. They play a role in the parliament in the Knesset. And uh, Sharansky is listened. People listen to him. Well, he's a very bright guy. Yeah. And a hero to Jews, the way he, sure, he withstood sure, everything. Sure. Uh, what is the future of the Likud party? I don't know. For the moment, I don't know. I am afraid uh, that the future is not bright. Really? Something doesn't work. Are you able to contribute to... Uh, no, not there? here. Now I am not able to contribute after I resigned. And I'm not uh, active anymore in anything. Therefore I cannot, I cannot contribute to it. And while I was looking about people, I am uh, talking with some of them. But uh, for the moment, I am not optimistic. You've always been consistent in the fact that you don't want to see a Palestinian state. You've said it many times. Sure, sure. Uh, were you very disappointed when you saw Bibi Netanyahu shake the hand so graciously of Arafat? No, I was disappointed of it because, uh, you know, you have to have your principles. And even uh, I remember once, uh, Kissinger said once many years ago that in this small country you cannot have two states. It's impossible. It will be a uh, consistent uh, confrontation, a permanent confrontation. And they said it, it's not good for America too, because we will be involved. And I think this is the situation. We have to have our country, our state. And well, the Arabs have many countries here. And. Uh, Therefore, I am against the Palestinian state. You know, you know our country, the, the dimensions of our country. It couldn't be smaller. And to give away uh, in other parts of the country, what will remain? Where will we bring immigrants? The Leon Sharney Report congratulates the team of BDC, The Price of Peace, and Leon Sharney on the New York Emmy Awards win. The documentary reveals the true story of the negotiations leading up to the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time, the Camp David Accords between Israel and Egypt. Watch it on Hulu.com or buy the special feature edition DVD at select stores. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the backdoor channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian peace treaty. Become a witness to history and order backdoor channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order backdoor channels. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish.
Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Lam. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. But in your opinion, is the whole process of, let's call it the Oslo process, is that dead today? It's dead. It's dead and uh, it's collapse, you know. It couldn't be, objectively, it couldn't be implemented. It couldn't be implemented because, first of all, the Palestinians, the Arabs, have not changed their mind. They're still against a Jewish state. They are against the state of Israel. Now this, uh, this fellow of the uh, Sheikh Yassin, the leader of the Hamas, was liberated and he speaks always, almost every day very extremely, very fanatically, and he has a great influence. And the others are not different. It's the same. And. Uh, I don't think we could accept a Palestinian state. It's, it will be a permanent war, and we want peace. <laughs> Talking about Sheikh Yassin, one of your former occupations was that you were a, a, a member of the Mossad. I don't know if you talk about it or you don't. I'm sure that the, the public knows anyway. At least uh, Tzvi Malchi knows, because he told me last week on my show that Yitzhak Shamir was, uh, was one, of the, one of the boys. Are you disappointed, uh, and disappointed is a tough word, uh, easy word, on the well, Jordanian cannot, uh, problem? I cannot go into details. I am, I am very, very disappointed about this, uh, this debacle. <laughs> we didn't need it. Was it amateurish? Well, <laughs> From all points of view, it was unnecessary. Right, you're one of the people who can really talk about this, because the Mossad and the Shin Bet come under the direct uh, hand of the Prime Minister. They both report to you. Yes. <coughs> and you were Prime Minister for quite a long period of time. Ultimately, it's the responsibility of the Prime Minister. But is it possible for the Prime Minister to really understand what's happening in these organizations all the time? He has to understand the main things, you know, not all the details. But he has to understand the, the, the positions, the situation inside, the moral situation. And uh, without it, you cannot uh, master the situation. And. Uh, it's a pity. It's a pity. Do you think that uh, basically people who head the Mossad should come from within the Mossad? Would that be better? It's not a rule. It's not a rule. There are some uh, examples uh, in favor of uh, such a doctrine and another doctrine. But uh, people who are coming from the Mossad, from within the Mossad, are more exper experienced. But uh, this is not the main, uh, the main factors. You need very, very intelligent people. Very intelligent. That's why you were there. Not, uh, and uh, the Prime Minister has to be a good, uh, has to know very well the men with whom he's working. Do you think that there'll have to be a change now? Well, I don't know what will happen. It doesn't depend on me. That's obvious. <coughs> but uh, if you were the Prime Minister? Uh, in such a case, it wouldn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Yitzhak, Syria bothers you today? Possibly a war with them? 
Well, I don't, uh, I don't think there will be a war with them, but they are enemies. They are our enemies, and uh, there is a deep hatred of Assad uh, against us and uh, Assad and these people. But I don't think they will dare to make a war with us. I don't think it. You know, they know our strength. And now it's, uh, the situation is not encouraging, the international situation is not encouraging uh, military operations. You know, uh, Soviet Russia doesn't exist anymore. The United States is the only world power and the position of the United States is well known. And Assad is an intelligent man and understands the position of the United States. Therefore, I don't think that uh, he's thinking about such an uh, alternative. The Soviet foreign minister, not the Soviet, the Russian foreign minister Primakov is yeah. in town today. Yes, I know. And uh, he wants to meddle and muddle a little bit in the Middle East, but meanwhile he's not paying his army. So uh, what, what power does he have to do? I don't think he's uh, well, he's a, uh, an expert in Middle Eastern problems. He was one well, head of the KGB. Yeah, the KGB. <coughs> but uh, I think that he understands the situation and uh, will not recommend a war. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. I read in these uh, memoirs of uh, this former Secretary of State, uh, Jim Baker, you know, and there is a story about a meeting in Moscow, I think, but in Russia, I think, between uh, the, uh, the two leaders, between Bush and uh, Gorbachev, and uh, Primakov, I think, or people of his uh, uh, of his organization came with a proposal to try to solve the Palestinian problem in the spirit of uh, of uh, Assad of, uh, of uh, Assad, uh, no, the, the the leader of Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein. And the condition will be, the American condition will be, that he will uh, uh, leave uh, Kuwait. And you know, in this book, in his book, Baker tried, he, is, he wrote that Bush was almost accepting this position. Really? We didn't know anything about it at this time. But Baker was very much against it. And in the end, he succeeded to convince Bush to let it down, not to accept it. You met with Bush, haven't you? Didn't you? George Bush, you met with him a few times. Sure, I met with him. Uh, you didn't have such uh, no, great No, no, I with. think he didn't like us. I think he didn't like us. And, uh, well, uh, I think that uh, it was not right in his assessments. He was more on the Arab side, Palestinians, Egyptians, Syrians, and maybe promised something to them. But, uh, well, he didn't succeed to implement its promises. <laughs> yeah, tough prime minister with principles. Uh, the Bushes are sometimes involved in oil, and that could be one of the reasons that they had more. Maybe, but well, this, the oil is uh, also today a problem, but it's not the main problem in the political uh, developments. No. What's your opinion of uh, Bill Clinton? I think, uh, well, I think uh, I, uh, I didn't, I don't have any reason to, to claim <laughs> about him. I think he's all right. Yesterday I uh, spoke with uh, Joseph Borg. We did an interview with him, who's uh, 
served in the government for a long, long period of time. Yeah, and I'm yeah. sure you know very well. Yeah, yeah. I asked him the question that arose in this country about the Yemenite children in the 50s and how they were uh, processed to, to other people and divorced, uh, I mean, uh, adopted. Uh, what's your take on that situation? I don't know exactly what happened to these times, these periods. I don't know. I think it's not very useful to talk about it. I think we have to forget it. It's, it belongs to the past. But what happens to the Yemenite uh, people? I don't know exactly what happened, uh, but uh, we cannot anything to change anything now in matters that happened uh, 50 years ago. And therefore, why to talk about it? <laughs> the integration uh, of the Sparta community with the Ashkenazi community, are you satisfied with? Yes, it's going well. I think it's going well. I don't think they have some reasons to claim about anything. You know, they have their political parties that are very powerful, the Shas people, and uh, they are getting stronger all the time. And well, in every party they have uh, some uh, members, important members. And well, it's not a problem now. Why is the Shas party so strong? Uh, you know, they have maybe they have uh, intelligent leaders. <laughs> <laughs> they are uh, they have the rabbi, the rabbi of Vadia. It's a kind of a spiritual leader, very impressive and very influential. And uh, the other, the real leader of the movement of the organization is uh, Derry, also a young man. Arya Derry. Arya Derry. He's uh, very, very intelligent. And well, uh, I, now they are in the coalition. Right. Well, are you, uh, I'm sure you're aware that the country is, there are citizens are calling you every minute. Hey, secretary tells me you get a lot of phone calls because they're unhappy with what the situation is today. Would a unity government today help solve some of maybe, this? Maybe, maybe. It depends uh, if the parties will uh, succeed, you know, to form a common program, a common policy with common principles for a time, for a limited time. It could, maybe it could help, because now there is too much an antagonism right. inside a country. It's not healthy. Maybe. When you did your unity government, was it very tough negotiating these sets of principles? Sure, sure. But uh, I think it was a success. People say today it was uh, not very efficient, uh, this government, because of the uh, differences of uh, views uh, between the parties, but it helped, it helped. And uh, the government was efficient in economic matters, and uh, it helped to make the atmosphere much better than now, for instance. There was not so a sharp, so a extreme uh, a confrontation between the main parties. It's not healthy for a country. There could be, there has, have to be differences, but not in such a way. So, in essence, if, if the two parties could work out a platform, you would be in favor? I am, I am for. All right, well, so, you're because uh, otherwise I don't know what, what will happen. And I am uh, uh, concerned. And therefore I would prefer a government of national unity, but with a good, uh, rational, common program.